Hey everyone. I am just astonished by this clicker that they had here because my Logitech clicker has never looked so poor. <laughs> and it even says Interspace Industries. I'm like I first time in my life I don't dare to press the, press the laser button. <laughs> Ooh. Cool. It's like it's like hardcore. All right, thanks for joining the session. I'm happy to be the one who gets to have you after lunch. Always a pleasure with your food coma. Um, <coughs> session is called Implementing Privileged Access Workstation, short introduction. My name is Sami Laiho. I've actually been here, I guess, seven years in a row, um, except for the COVID year. But I've changed my title since. I'm not a senior technical fellow for my own company anymore. So I'm actually a chief research officer for TrueSec. And we just established TrueSec Finland about one and a half months ago. So um, trying to guide the fast growing security company into a, or keep their techs in order, let's say. Try to um, guide us on the correct track. We have a big sock. Big stock in Sweden and offices in a few different countries around the world. And uh, for me, this was mainly to get my access to big data. So I've always been doing sessions on security, but I always had to reference someone else's data, threat intelligence reports from F-Secure or TrueSec or whatever. But now I have my own data, so I'm uh, actually super happy. And someone else is paying my trip here, which is awesome. I've been self-employed for 12 years. Next summer, I'll have four weeks of vacation and someone pays me six weeks salary. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> so, uh, there's goods and bads for everything. Anyway, uh, <coughs> I've always started to kind of protect my customer environments by trying to implement very important concepts and start off with things like getting rid of admin rights, principle of least privilege, or, or um, implementing allow listing like app locker, stuff like that. Now things have gotten quite crazy. If you are still here for the lock note, I'll tell you just how crazy. Um, Finland has more border with Russia than the whole European Union combined, so we got a lot of stuff, ha stuff happening there. Um, nowadays, what I try to do first very fast is try to get the attack surface down. And while we're trying to get the attack surface down, I guess there's really no better way than if, if we can't isolate you from the internet, then I would say that there's really no better way of taking down your attack surface than implementing privileged access workstations. So the idea here is um, very simple. Why does PAW fail? PAWs fail because people read Microsoft's instructions. Stop doing that, okay? Um, that's a, honestly, that's not even a joke. That's the biggest problem in this whole concept. Because people assume that when you take that poor material from Microsoft, it would be good for you. It's good for military, yes. I actually just met a customer uh, from Switzerland. And they came to me and said, we were, we were really listening to your session about this in the Workplace Ninja Summit in Lucerne a few weeks ago. And uh, we thought that maybe you should help us because we're really annoyed about the fact that we have to carry four laptops all the time. I was like, what? Why, why are you carrying four laptops all the time? Well, it says so in the Microsoft document. Okay, I can help your life, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> we have to remember that Microsoft serves all sorts of customers. They're not going to sadly write different kinds of instructions for normal small companies in Europe compared to US military. So sadly, they are good for some of you, 
we have some banks, we have some medical facilities, we have people that will actually benefit from the same kind of level of protection, but the concept is, is way more important than how you actually execute it, okay? If you can use a device to take down the company, you should, should not be able to Facebook on it. Relatively simple concept. That's it, we're done, thank you, next session. Um, but it seems to be really difficult to understand. I read a book by Mikko Hyppönen, the Finnish uh, Chief Research Officer for F-Secure. It's the reason why my title is Chief Research Officer. It's a tribute to Mikko, he's my guru. So uh, anyway, uh, Mikko wrote a book I think he won a name your book competition in Finland. He named his book Internet. Um, Mikko says on the book that he always goes to a customer and he get, asks for a tour and he goes around the company and then they get to the financing department. And one of the biggest problems in Europe when we think about how much money gets withdrawn out of companies or stolen from companies Really, even today, one of the statistically one of the biggest problems is the CEO scams. So you get an email that's pretending to come from your CEO. You have to pay this invoice immediately. Usually happens during summertime when we have interns working. So they will tell you that you have to do it instantly now, and then the money gets paid to an incorrect bank account. Um, so Mikko goes and gets to the financing department and then they find a person there who takes care of these invoices. And then Mikko goes to them and asks them like, so what, which computer do you use to pay those million dollar invoices? This one. This is my computer. I'm really proud. Okay, so which computer do you use to Facebook? The same. You can start your privilege access workstation from there. Don't let your accounting people pay their million dollar invoices from a computer that can Facebook. It's probably your best protection currently. Okay. Privileged access workstation is usually thought of just being the mechanism where we protect company computers that can use horribly strong management tools and stuff like that. But this should apply for everything. I am seriously considering, I have two laptops. I didn't need a new laptop, but I have an employer who said that you can get a new laptop. So I haven't had that pleasure in 12 years. So I actually got a new laptop. And I was very much willing to wait for seven weeks to get the OLED screen, which I have always needed for business use. Um, but I'm seriously thinking maybe I should start using this as my personal computer. Because now I work for a security company and maybe I should just keep my stuff on that other laptop. Because for example on that laptop now when it's been my own company's computer, I'll show you how I've operated my PAW so far. But I honestly have NHL 95 on the same computer. I play NHL 95 all the time. I'm old, I know. But I, I, whenever I'm on a flight, I play NHL 95. Like, I feel a little bit bad now. I mean, maybe I honestly should keep that stuff away from my computer. Maybe the fact is that the co-work computer should now actually be used for work. I had a session in Helsinki for a customer they had already taken away the admin rights from the customers, but they hired me to go in front of the audience and say it was my idea. I actually get hired quite often to just be a scapegoat. It's really cool. So it's a lot easier for the customers, employees to hate me as a consultant than hate their IT department. So I can just walk out, leave, be paid, all good. They have to stay there and serve their customers throughout the year. I was there saying it was my idea, everything had already been done, and then I was telling this one guy stood up from his chair, super angry, right? face red angry, he yells at me, you make this sound like we're not supposed to do anything with our computers but work. <laughs> Amazing. Apparently it took a while to sink in. 
that the work computers are actually meant for work. I did a big uh, allow listing project with AppLocker for a medical institute. Very, very secret stuff that they have. Top five apps run in the network. Uh, 3D Pony Simulator. I honestly don't dare to ask what it is, but uh, 3D Pony Simulator, uh, Movie Star Planet. That one I know because my daughters play Movie Star Planet. And then the third one was Roblox. Okay? I don't know, maybe for medical purpose you want to see the anatomy of a pony in 3D. Well, it was for humans. But anyway, so um, it's kind of uh, disastrous in many ways how the companies take care of their take care of their security. So um, for me, it's always been a virtual machine. So I have a paw on my machine running there, but it's a VM. Only from that VM can you actually take down the company. You can't take down the company from a computer that gets on Facebook or reads my email. So when you start reading that information from Microsoft and it says like you have to implement this and this and this and you end up with seven laptops and blah, 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 blah. Just stop, okay? They're not for you. They're good for the military. They might be good for police, banks, whatever, but most of you don't stop the project because it seems too difficult. If we think about the whole uh, concept itself, Microsoft started introducing this maybe about a decade ago. And uh, I, made, I did a session in Orlando for Microsoft Ignite about this, and I had a session before me that was hosted by Microsoft. So Microsoft Techs were doing a Privileged Access Workstation session, and I was doing my own, so I wanted to be there so that we don't go over too much, or don't overlap too much. And I, uh, I went to listen to it, and I, it, one thing that just stuck in my head was the fact when they asked, everyone raised their hands up, hands up if you need two computers to do your daily work. And well, you can all guess there's like almost everyone raises their hands. And then, okay, so keep your hands up if you need three, four. And we still had a few guys hands up at seven. They came to me after the session and, and well, actually I was there in the front of it, but they came to in front of there and they, they, I was like, are you really carrying seven laptops with you? Yeah. So I have one for, one for the tier zero, one for tier one, one for tier two, and the military has both the production network and the normal network, and then you have one to read your email. I really like ultra books. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Think about it, like seven laptops with you in your backpack to do your work. That same year, Microsoft finally made a relaxation into the rules, which was that now you can actually run your production stuff on the host, and then you run your management stuff in the workstation. Because up to 2016, Microsoft said that you have to run the secure stuff on the host, and then you do your office stuff in the VM. Well, I wouldn't ever be able to do that. My job is mostly encoding video. How the hell am I going to encode MP4 videos with Camtasia running in a VM? Okay, that's not gonna work. It's always been really stupid because you have like two management tools that don't need any CPU power and you run them on the host. That was only because only the host could guarantee the integrity of the firmware, for example. But now we have VMs that can be using secure boot, TPM, speed locker, so that's why they relaxed that. Before you can implement POS, you need the tier model, so every environment gets tiered like this. We have three tiers, your workstations, your servers, your domain controllers, usually the top one has PKI, maybe identity management. Then we do the most important thing, which is blocking domain admins from logging on to anything but servers. Oh, sorry, anything but DCs, remember? Very common trivia question from Microsoft. TechEd trivia originally is the first one I heard this in. They have very tricky questions because you have very smart people in the lunch area. So 
one question was true or false. In a default Active Directory domain, domain admins don't have any privileges on any workstations or member servers. Most would answer that it's false, they have full privileges, but they're absolutely correct, true. Domain admins don't have any privileges on any of your workstations or member servers. Because they all got get those only because of belonging to the administrator's group of the machine. Domain admins happens to be there by default. But if I put Sammy into the same group as domain admins, I am bit to bit as powerful on that machine. The only place where you have access control list entries that say domain admins have something is a DC. I just had a call this morning. Sammy, we have a customer for TrueSec. Norwegian customer needs a little bit help. It's like, what's the problem? They have 44 domain admins. Jeez, okay? You have a serious problem. You should have like maybe five or four would sound good. But if you have more than that, you're in deep trouble already, okay? So that's the first thing. We do a group policy that blocks domain admins from logging on to anything but domain controllers, or we do that in Azure, doing that with Intune policies. Okay, same thing. It's nowadays available there as well. Server admins get group policies that block them from logging on to anything but servers. Workstation admins have the same thing. And no, the picture is not ready yet. I see so many taking pictures. I'm saving your, saving your memory. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you when it's done. I can sign it. Um, I am the most hated person in many companies. I know. First he comes and takes off my, uh, my admin rights. I can't do anything anymore. Big Brother is watching. I actually had some, I got so fed up a few months ago that I actually tweeted out admin rights are not human rights. Because <laughs> it's just so freaking annoying. I want to be an admin, I've always been an admin. I'm a dev, I can't work without admin rights. Yes, you can. Last summer I met one person I have, I thought it would be a hallucination, but I actually met a dev who came to me and said, could he please get rid of his admin rights? Let that sink in for a moment. Developer who wants to get rid of admin rights. I almost cried. Yeah, it took a while. Kind of the same thing happened with BitLocker as well. I had a young student, maybe 20 years old, came to a course of mine. And he comes in and I start explaining why we need BitLocker on every, de every device, whether it has data or not, because it's for integrity of the machine, not for the data protection. That's just a secondary thing. And I started explaining, and this young guy looked at me like really funny, and he looks at me, and then he's like, Sammy, can I just ask you, like, have, why wouldn't someone have encryption? It's like, you know what? I've been waiting for that for 16 years. Someone comes into a course thinking it's funny that someone wouldn't have encryption. Normally, I just have to convince people, yes, you need it, even if you think you don't need it, you do need it, and blah, 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 blah. But th this guy was like, just, that's so weird. Someone without encryption. I wish that would happen with admin rights. Someone comes to the classroom and is like, why, why, why should anyone be an admin? Like, oh, yes. Because that I've been doing 22 years now and still hasn't happened. I've been teaching that stuff. Anyway, so I know I'm the hated, most hated person because I'll make you use three different user accounts with three different MFAs and UPI keys and whatever. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. World has changed. <laughs> really sorry. <laughs> there are many things we thought would not happen, like Russia invades Ukraine. No one saw that coming. I'm sorry. World is not the same. Okay? I'm a geek. The most fun I'm having every break that we have is I'm looking at my home assistant because I just finished building a Raspberry Pi to control my heating of the house because my house electricity bill is 500 euros per month. But since October 1st, it would have been 3000 euros per month. So I started doing home automation. I have a lot of motivation. Honestly, things have changed. And that's the same thing here. You cannot operate with a single account. Really sorry. 
If that's how you did before, you can't anymore. Is there someone in the room, uh, you, you will get like beaten up if you raise your hand, so this is an impossible question, but is there someone in the audience who thinks MFA is a bad idea? <laughs> Honestly, some time ago that was still many people. I will not accept this username and password, it's just fine. MFA, and now everyone is, okay, so nowadays we need a MFA. Nowadays you need many admin accounts, sorry. This won't work, technically. What about this guy who wants to manage group policy from his workstation? You do know that group policy cannot be managed from a server. Technically, to 100%, it will not. Many people think that this is just some security stuff that Sami is saying, but you have to remember group policy is not updated by updating ADMX and ADML files only. Group policy reads those values that it shows, for example, for services from the operating system below which means you can never ever get, if you want to manage group policy, I have a few examples there you can see. You always need a privileged access workstation. Microsoft has since the beginning of Windows 2000 said in the documentation that RDP, which stands for Ransomware Deployment Protocol, <laughs> is for emergency purposes only. It says in the documentation, you have two terminal services connections for every server, since Windows 2000, and it says, for emergency purposes only. There's only two licenses on every server. My biggest customer has 550,000 workstations. Think about them, they have 400 admins. If they would work like we do here in Europe, they wouldn't do anything but call each other. Hi, this is Sami, can you log off the server? There's no free sessions. <laughs> Hi, this is Sami, can I kick you off the se server? There's no free sessions. Hi, this is Sami, there's only two people on the server. Since Windows 2000, you were supposed to manage your servers with AirSat, Remote Server Administration Tools, which has 16.7 million licenses per computer. And some people look surprised. If this was news, I'm sorry. Anyway, so when you're supposed to always manage group policy from a workstation, if you want to create perfect group policies for Windows 11, 22, H2, you need to install AirSat on Windows 11 22H2. What if you install it here? And then you want to manage policies in the domain. You log on here with your workstation admin, which has no privileges to, mo to change the policies. So you use run as. You just run as admin, put in your domain admin privileges, which are blocked by the policy. This doesn't work. And I have many companies that do tiering and then they come, to me, come back to me and say, it really doesn't work. It's just impossible. That's because this all gets fixed with the PAW. PAW is the one that allows you to do the exception here. You can log on with a higher privileged account on a PAW. Okay. Some Active Directory stuff. So that's how you have to at least split your, I used to call them secure workstations forever. Microsoft has this cool term, privileged access workstations. So, but I used to call them secure workstations. Anyway, the domain controllers are separated by design and then you have four servers workstations. At least that you have to build. I'm so sorry I forgot, it's ready. Because <laughs> I, now I saw someone again taking a picture and I realized I didn't say it's ready. my precious. Here's your five policies, not four, not three, but five. I have shown this since 2016 to my customers in different conferences that there are five policies. Last week I did two audits for companies that had listened to my session and they had three. Five, please. Okay. Someone tells me that they should they could just remove uh, they could just remove the domain admins from the administrators group. That doesn't help at all. That's a silly setting. Some people do that, so we just remove domain admins from the administrators so they're not admins anymore. But then if you log on with the domain admin that belongs to the domain users, they can log on to the computer 
although they don't have any admin rights, they leave their hashes there, which means you take the hash and pass it to the DC and you own the company. Doesn't help. That's not the solution. The solution is policies that prevent you from doing this. As a server, a little bit different settings. All PowerPoints will be delivered to you after the conference. I have not remembered to send them to Kurt, but I remember, I promise I will. When you do this, you have to start managing your local admins. There's a few different ways of doing it. This is group policy preferences. Why do some people use this? Because it supports variables. You can easily do rules like computer da dash computer name dash vs admin will always be part of our administrators. So then you just create a group for every computer that you have, and that group will automatically be added to the workstations, uh, workstations administration, administrators group, and then you put the person in there or the group in there, and you manage it from Active Directory without ever visiting those computers. The maybe more recommended one is restricted groups. But if you don't do anything else, do at least this. This is the bare minimum. You'll see this later in the lock note as well. So this is the bare minimum you have to do. Stop domain admins from logging on to anything but DCs. Do this before you do any other security features in your company. Because if you don't do this, then you're going to work on miniature minor things and you get preached and no one's going to respect your work. So that's why I always say this is the first thing you do. Then we start discussing things like app locker. Then we start discussing things like getting rid of your admin rights. But those are projects that take a while and you will get preached between that time. Not hopefully you, but some will. Do this always as the first thing. Why? Because I have that big data now. Last year I worked with 21 different, just very funny that it's year 21 and 21, but uh, anyway, 21 cases where the company was breached and after that they contacted me. 19 of those environments would have been safe if this was in place. 19 out of 21 big breaches. One concept. Your outsourcing partners won't like this because your outsourcing partners will say, oh no, I, if I have to have enough rights to manage everything. That, that, but that's just again the thing, they've done it for 20 years. So that's, sorry, you need two accounts now. Maybe three, maybe even four, but I mean, sorry, that's life. Adding groups, restricted groups. I have been teaching to use this group, this group policy setting since Windows 2000. I've been teaching Active Directory for 22 years. And yet people have absolutely no idea how it works. What I mean by that is usually people tell me that if you put something here, it throws out all the other admins. But no, it has two different modes. Administrators, if you put the group here, and you say administrators has Sami, yes, it will kick out everyone except Sami. But if you do it this way, computer admins needs to belong to administrators, then it only adds. This is up and this is replace. Well, one of the first things you always do is this as well. Local account and member of administrators group. It's a pseudo group in, um, that was introduced in Windows 8.1. It is a group that we can use to block past the hash attacks against local accounts. Do this in case you don't have laps. If you have laps, you don't need this. But this one you can deploy snap of fingers if I would know how to snap my fingers. But um, that's easy to put in. It, uh, it effectively does the same as laps in that sense that if you have the same username and password on two computers and you try to pass the hash through that, it won't work because you're part of the local admin and a local account and you're denied access. Band-aid, permanent fixes laps. A uh, few links. Then someone anyway wants to do this in the native cloud. So if you're Azure, then you do the same thing with global admins. Global admins will be blocked from logging onto endpoints, which they are uh, full admins by default. 
so they get locked, and then you have the workstation admins that you will allow to manage endpoints, but not the tenant. Again, exactly same concept, buttons are in different places. And because it's Azure, buttons will be in different places every week. <laughs> but here, nowadays it's done, this was the old one, horrible, Omayuri stuff, insanely unmanageable, but now you have this user rights settings management in the settings catalog, which means you can actually manage this easily. Prevent other than admins from logging on to your administration portal. This is security by obscurity, because you can still do PowerShell, you can still use Graph API. It only blocks the GUI. It's just good to understand, but it's still good to have, okay? You can always delegate roles. Sami is delegated just a billing administrator, sadly. But now Sami is gonna get out of that group. Sami is so happy. I put true sec people here. Group management became available about a year ago. It was before, but with XML files. Nowadays Intune can just manage all the groups as you want, would from AD, super simple. Azure AD had one uh, premium feature before, but this would not be the one recommended anymore because this one adds those people to administrators group on all devices, as here you can do full management, so there's no reason to use that other one. Do not kick out these SIDs. You see these on your Azure AD joint devices, they're your global admins and your device owner's roles. If you want to translate these SIDs, SIDs are calculated very different than they were for Windows. Windows had a first part domain or computer SID, and then you have the relative, relative ID at the end. This one is actually a base64 calculation from your Azure object ID. So you can translate this. We have a MVP, Oliver Kieselbach who has done a uh, great script for this, or you can just use the Graph API to search for those SIDs and you'll find the names from there as well. Don't kick them out. So now when you have this in place, then the poor part starts. So concept is simple, like I said. Don't let accounts that can take down your environment log on to devices with access to malware. Don't let computers that can take down your environment talk to Facebook. World's simplest containerization of threats. If you have a computer that can access malware, it does not have admin rights. Okay? If you have a computer that can manage your environment, it cannot access malware. Really difficult to do on a single computer, super simple to do on two computers, hence concept of privileged access workstations. Takes down your attack surface of your company by 95% instantly. That's very hard to achieve with any other security feature. What does that poor workstation then have? It has AirSat installed, allows you to access Windows Admin Center, which is supposed to replace AirSat at some point. I call it the iPaw. That's just my name for it. I had so much fun. I was in, I was in uh, Orlando for Ignite and I finally had the big Chapin Theater which had like 2,500 people. And then I had my time, I, I, I played my Steve Jobs moment because I got to introduce the iPod. It's just so fun. iPod is the same as the previous ones except it does not have one policy here. That one missing policy is allow, uh, deny logon locally. It's the only thing that's missing from here. Otherwise, it's the same. So on that machine, you can log on with high-privileged users. Why do we do this? What I just told you, management tools were never meant to work on, work uh, on servers. I saw your face, I can't help it, but I saw your face when I said that you can't do group policy management from a server and you looked like you were wondering why. So I have a good blog post. Many of you probably know Jeremy Moscovich, policy pack founder, good friend of mine. And Jeremy once wrote about AirSat, and I actually started to write another blog post based on that, or actually not based on that, but because of that. 
and I uh, wrote this blog post. It's 10 years old, it's still one of my most referenced blog posts by Microsoft's internal people, because people do not understand that you cannot manage your group policy from a server. Okay? So here are examples. Here's a friend of mine sends me a picture, I want to disable web clients because it slows down connections to unknown UNC paths. Where is it? I updated my ADMX and ADML files to be up to date, my group policy editor is up to date, I can't see web clients. Yes, you can't, because that's not the way it works. It's nothing to do with ADMX and ADML files. Then he sends me another picture. I also want to disable Angry Birds too. It's very bad for the Finnish economy. Don't let anyone do that. It's a Finnish game. Our tax taxes heavily heavily require admin uh, heavily require Angry Birds 2 to sell well. So do not do this. Okay. But he's sending me this. I want to disable Angry Birds 2. It's not on the list. And I think this is the time when he woke up, because I asked him, "Do you seriously hope that your server would have Angry Birds 2?" No, not really. Hmm, good point. Where's that list coming from? Hmm, okay. So then you do the same on a Windows 10 workstation, Windows 11 workstation, whatever. This list is read from the client. So there's your web client. You can now manage it. If you want to see the apps, there are your apps because they're actually present on a client. So remember, the editor does not only read ADMX and ADML files, it actually reads values from the OS. That's why you need to have the same OS. It was never a problem for Microsoft, because Microsoft has always operated like this. You can't manage Azure from anything but a Windows 10 or Windows 11 workstation. There's no RDP open. You can't do RDP like we do for everything. I could talk an hour of why Europe people, European people love RDP. It's just insane how much people use it. Although it's 70, close to 75% of all attacks are how, so, how, somehow related to RDP. So. Uh, Windows Admin Center is supposed to replace it. Great. What I will do for the rest of the time that I have, I'll show you two paws. Okay? So I have a paw which is built in an on-prem environment, and I have a paw that's built for an Azure environment. If we go back half a year, building a paw on-prem would be easy. Building it in Azure was painful. Today, building a paw in Azure is super trivial compared to building it on-prem. Microsoft just made it super easy because of the introduction of device IDs for conditional access. That made this super, super easy. Okay? So let's see. This is first an on-prem environment. This on-prem environment is built so that the end results, so we're all on the same network. I never use any. I, use, I do micro segmentation like everyone wants because it's cool zero trust stuff. But people forget that you had IPsec for 22 years for free, which does micro-segmentation. So people pay crazy amounts of money for Zscaler or whatever. So this is just purely uh, IPsec. This is a normal workstation, has all sorts of access, whatever. If I try to log on to our domain controller, that won't work. We have another machine on the same network. If I want to log on with RDP from here, I can, okay? How's that done? Computers that need to connect to me, which are the privileged access workstations, they have IPsec enabled. Then we have our domain controller that has IPsec, IPsec enabled. People hate IPsec because they think IPsec is encryption. No, it's not. I only use AH protocol, which is authentication only. People think it's heavy. No, it's not because I don't use encryption. People think it's only related to VPNs. No, it's not. It's supported from Windows 2000 for free on any platform of Windows. So only they speak IPsec because when I say IPsec, people are like, oh no, we have Linux. Oh no, we have I iPads. Oh no, we have printers. I'm not deploying IPsec for the freaking whole company. Stop doing that. I just want to use IPsec when his paw talks to my DC or servers or whatever. I, I just stop thinking you have to do IPsec everything because then you can't print in some cases. I have killed a million roses in a greenhouse with IPsec. It really can be dangerous, but 
we're not talking about just forcing it everywhere. Just these pipes that go from a more trusted computer to the server. First step on every security audit I do. Company, first computer I see. Usually it's uh, someone working at the lobby. Take that computer. Check what the domain controller is. Take MSTSC, type in the DC name. If that opens an authentication prompt, you're screwed. It's a very good way of auditing your own environment. If you can RDP from any machine to your DC, that has absolutely no protection for you that, you, that people don't use, know the username and password. That's what people mostly tell me. No, but no one used to use, knows the username and password. That's not the problem. RDP is a weak protocol, not just weak authentication. So that they speak IPsec, and then the real uh, prevention is done here. Inbound restrictions for RDP. Let's. Uh, there we go. What I have here is a Windows firewall rule. After establishing that these can talk to IP, these can talk IPsec to each other. Then I have done an IPsec policy here, which says that Windows Defender Firewall. Inbound rule. Five rules copied from the original, t original RDP rules. So we have rules that say that you are not allowed to use RDP. That applies to everyone. And then we have two RDP settings here, which say that allow the connection if it is secure. And the magic happens here. Override block rules. Okay. So anyone who can identify themselves and belongs to that Active Directory group will be able to use RDP. Super simple. You don't need any equipment. You don't have to pay 8021x authentication anymore because unknown computers can talk, blah, blah, blah. IPsec. I have deployed more IPsec in the last two years than I have in my whole career before that because zero trust is such a cool thing now. World's stupidest name ever for a solution. But anyway, um, so that's ending in this. This guy has, this is asked for credentials because the Work, because it works. You can tie it to users as well, meaning only Ben can speak RDP if logging on from a ball. Okay, so you can combine users and computers as well. And after that, you don't have to worry about firewall management because you have group police, you have Active Directory groups. I love it because you identify every computer and every user, and then you just we have a rule set allow RDP. Then you take a person, put him in there, and blah. Oh, it all works. Well, what about Azure? Here I have my traditional computer. I can go online. You just saw me go online to my own blog. If I want to say, let's log on to portal.azure.com. Uh, admin, uh, admin at adminize.com it's a demo that must not I don't think that's correct let's do it this way and it speaks perfect Finnish so you understand it great thanks it says you can't use this resource right now your username and password were correct but you do not fulfill the requirements for using the resource because this is not a paw if I want to use a paw I have a computer, not here, that's team viewer, sorry. Here's a Hyper-V machine running on my machine. Check this out, Facebook. Does not work. I have another browser here. Portal, adworks, admin at adminize.com. Oh no. These stupid Security things, you know, so annoying. Don't know who an idiot, what an idiot did this. Okay. So there, 
you have a uh, working Azure portal. This is done with super simple trick. We have a uh, rule set that, shop that throws all proxy requests to the loopback address except for this list which has the list for re Azure required connection points, okay? So I can do all of this here. I don't need any both licenses for doing this. I don't need firewall, whatever. All of this is done with an Azure AD conditional access. Let's just find it here. Block require pause. Super, super simple. Exclude. That's excluding our break class account so that they won't be uh, affected. And then global admins are blocked access. Come on. Where's the restriction? One condition selected. And then exclude filter devices. And there you see the only magic that this has, which is that we have the uh, we have the device ID filters there. Come on! There you go. Okay. Device ID filters. These two are the comp the device IDs for the pause. That's it. All right. We can pretend that. I'm perfect on time. The most important trick for any speaker is remember that in this case, when you actually have like 45 slides that you didn't get to go through, press the end button. It takes you to the last slide and it looks good, okay? So you can get the slides later on. There's more information on protecting those paws and stuff like that, but the concept is the important one here. Remember that you isolate things that can get online from getting on your management stuff. Take down your Attack surface by 95%. And uh, if you need more information, there's a, actually a course on this topic available in my dojo for free. All right. Uh, I'll see you at the lock note. Thanks, everyone, for coming.